Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Janet Wing. Uh, Dr. Janet Wing is the Corporate Vice President and she oversees the labs, um, of core research labs across the world for Microsoft Research Corporation. Prior to this, um, Dr. Wing was at Carnegie Mellon University and also she was director of one of the divisions of National Science Foundation. Her areas of expertise are in trustworthy computing, formal methods, concurrent and distributed systems, programming languages, and software engineering. She's also part of various committees and boards. Uh, she's current vice chair of uh, DARPA Information Science Technology. And she's also part of the President's Council Advisor of Science and Technology in the US. I welcome Dr. J uh, Janet Wink to come and speak. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good response. I don't know why you're uh, cheering me, but thank you. Uh, and I, I, Vidya told me why you're chatting away, so just be quiet until, uh, until this afternoon after all the talks are over. So this morning you heard from Peter and Anadon about um, what it takes to do research. Who are the kinds of people who are researchers. Um, and you heard a little bit from Han about what do researchers work on? What kinds of problems do they work on? What I want to talk about is not just research in the general, but research in computer science. And I want to talk about also some stories about um, what kinds of research computer scientists work on. But I also want to talk about the impact of the research that, do, that they do, and why that might choose a particular problem to work on, or what motivates them in the first place. So I'm going to talk about computer science research. I'm going to talk about computer science research's impact on science, technology, and society. I'd like to first start with this triad of science, technology, and society, and talk about the drivers of computing. I use this term drivers of computing to indicate if I'm a researcher in computer science and I'm trying to figure out um, what problem to work on, I might look at fundamental questions of computer science, science questions of computer science. For instance, what is computable? What can a machine compute? What can a machine not compute? What problems can machines solve? What problems can machines not solve? So there might be, there are deep science questions in our field in computer science that drive researchers to pursue their research goals, to pursue the problems they work on. People like Robbie Conan you heard about earlier today. Another area of, um, that drives the kind of research problems computer scientists choose is, of course, technology. Technology advances expeditiously and exponentially. Um, and every time there's a new technology, it re-raises the old questions of the past in computer science. We often ask the same questions but answer them in different ways because of new technology. And finally, Something that's much more prevalent today than in when I started as a computer scientist is societal grand challenges. People today, people like yourselves, people like Bill Tees, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, you um, try to address larger grand challenges of society, like healthcare and energy and the environment. And those Societal grand challenges drive the kind of questions that computer scientists ask, thinking maybe in advances in computer science or maybe in advances in computing technology, we can help address these societal grand challenges. We can help potentially transform the very nature of healthcare. And so these are the kinds of drivers of computing. These are the um, 
the, the ways in which a computer science researcher might think of what problem to work on. And once you choose a problem and you're persistent and you're, uh, you discover and you create and so on, just as was discussed this morning, what you hope in the end is to have an impact on, the, on either science or technology or society or all three of them through the results that you attain in conducting research. So, of course, if you are a theoretical computer scientist, you might pursue a, a theoretical problem for the sake of just pursuing the problem. But you never know that the solution to that problem might have, in, a, in 10 or 20 years, an impact on a new technology or an impact on a way that some other sector, like healthcare, um, can be affected. So, I'm going to talk about um, research impact along the lines of science, technology, and society, and I'm going to use this triad to tell my stories. But I, what I really want to close my talk with is not so much what we've done and some of the stories uh, showing what kind of research Microsoft researchers have done, but I want to use this triad to talk about what's coming what you in the audience will be working on as researchers in computer science. So I want to talk about the future of computing along these three axes. So before I begin, I do want to share with you um, the mission of Microsoft Research. This is something Anadam alluded to earlier this morning. This is the mission statement that all of us at Microsoft Research uh, ascribe to. And the first one you'll notice is really very basic. It's advanced the field in the areas we choose to do research. It's advancing state of the art. Oh. Should I start again? <laughs> it's advancing to the state of the art. The second uh, mission is to transfer best, our best research into Microsoft's products. And the third is to ensure the future of Microsoft and of the computing and related disciplines. And I'm not going to belabor the, the mission statement of Microsoft Research um, too much. I just wanted to share with you them, especially since Anadam uh, showed how they were specified or uh, tailored for Microsoft Research India. This is Microsoft's Research Global Presence. You'll see that we have labs around the world. Um, and this is my triad with the mission statement overlaid. Um, you'll get Every researcher in Microsoft Research um, is either advancing science or adva uh, advancing technology or addressing a societal grand challenger, all three. So now let me actually start with a few stories. And I'm going to tell a science story, a technology story, uh, a, societal, a society story, and then one last story that wraps it up. And then I'm going to uh, uh, talk about where I see the trends of computer science being. The, these are going to be the opportunities for all of you as future researchers in computer science to be thinking about where your research problem is going to come from. So the science story I want to start with is uh, a, a, a story that comes from some work at, uh, done by Microsoft researcher uh, Nikhil Srivastava and two colleagues at Yale University. And it's a story of computer science meets quantum mechanics. The problem that they were addressing is, is it possible to take a set of small vectors who in, whose energy in every test direction is equal to one and partition this set of small vectors into a red-blue red partition in such a way that the energy um, comes, uh, half the energy comes from the red vectors and half the energy comes from the blue. So it's called splitting a quadratic form in half. And before I actually state the theorem of what they prove, I want to give you a little background of what I just said in terms of test vectors and energy and so on. So consider these four vectors in two-dimensional space. And in the test vector direction, the test direction along the x-axis, 
We can then compute the energy of these four vectors um, by just uh, calculating um, how much energy each individual vector um, contributes along the, the test direction. So this uh, set of four vectors has some ener of energy you can compute to 1.5. And I can consider a different test direction along the y-axis, and you'll see the energy is greater intuitively because three of the vectors are pointing upwards more towards the y-axis. And you can do this in every test direction to compute the energy of these four vectors in every test direction. And what you can do then is basically draw an ellipsoid around the test vectors. This ellipsoid in each test direction basically tells you what the, direction, what the energy is in that direction. So this is just a, a, an algebraic structure. It's called a quadratic form. Um, and what's, it's, so the ellipsoid is the quadratic form. So now I can state the, the theorem that was proved, and that is um, given a set of sufficiently small vectors whose energies in each test direction is equal to one, um, I, is it, I, can, I can always find a partition of this set of uh, small vectors into two parts, the red and the blue, um, such that um, each part basically contributes half uh, energy, half of its energy to um, the original set of, t uh, t of vectors. So this was, seems like uh, not such a difficult uh, theorem to prove, but in fact uh, it is profound because many, many different disciplines find that quadratic forms show up naturally um, in the problems that they are trying to solve. And also, it turns out that this theorem implies an outstanding conjecture since 1959 that was stated in quantum mechanics. And so, clearly, it was not an easy uh, theorem to prove. And this theorem was proved uh, last June. It was truly a breakthrough result uh, in mathematics. So the um, I mentioned already that there are other quadratic, there are quadratic forms that are found in other disciplines, for instance, in computer science. And it was actually in understanding this particular computer science problem that the computer scientist Nickel and his colleagues were, were struggling with and stumbled upon the generalization which led to the theorem that they stated and proved. This is an, a very typical computer science problem where you're given a graph and you try to partition the graph, in this case into two pieces, in such a way that the, the subgraphs ha, um, have the same properties uh, that you care about of the original graph. In this particular case, we have uh, uh, two subgraphs, each are uh, have the same number of nodes but fewer edges and the property that we want to preserve of the original graph uh, is the cut properties. So each, uh, the cuts of each of the subgraphs are approximately the same as the cut of, of the original graph. And the reason you want to do this is because it's easier, uh, that means more efficient, uh, to run algorithms over the subgraph and it's uh, usually you have, uh, you need less storage for the subgraphs. And so you want to be able to do this kind of partitioning. This kind of decomposition of a big problem into smaller, uh, uh, smaller solvable problems is common o in computer science. You see this over and over again, whether it's in a data structure like a graph or a program um, or a large system. And so it's very, a very common technique in computer science to decompose a large problem into smaller problems to solve the smaller problems knowing that you either can solve the smaller problems to imply that the solution of the larger problem or put together the solutions of the smaller problem 
uh, problems and then get the answer for the larger problem. So this is a very common technique of decomposing a, a, a large problem into smaller ones. Quadratic forms are also um, found in uh, understanding signal processing. If you substitute the uh, coefficients from discrete Fourier transforms, the, you basically get vectors um, as in the quadratic form case. And this hints at the uncertainty principle that's found in signal processing, which basically says you can't localize a signal in both the time and frequency domains. But as I mentioned, this theorem Im implies the Cadenson-Singer conjecture, which was outstanding since 1959. And what was interesting about this part of the story is that the physicists and the mathematicians who have been trying to prove this conjecture thought that it was false. And so for, since 1959, many, many decades of researchers, physicists, mathematicians, were actually trying to prove this theorem was false, or the conjecture was false. And it's no wonder they, they struggled, because in fact, it's true. So, that's my science story. I want to move to a technology story. And this is the problem of video stabilization. So here we have a, a, a video that you can see is pretty shaky. These kinds of videos you often take with your smartphone that has maybe a, a video camera on it. What we are able to do in our research is to stabilize that kind of video and see a much smoother version of what we just shot. So I'm going to tell you a, a two tricks that we used in order to affect this. Um, first, let me start with the standard video stabilization pipeline. You start with a, a, a video that has many frames, and what you first try to do is compute a, a camera path from frame to frame. And so that's what's done in this first step. The second step is actually to smooth out that camera path, because all, obviously if you're going from one frame to the other, it could, it could be quite jerky from one frame to for, uh, the next. So you're smoothing out the camera path. And then once you do that, then you can basically warp each image to, be, um, uh, to adapt to the smooth path. And that gives you the final video. And that's what video stabilization is all about. Well, in this research, there are two um, ideas that enabled us to do much smoother video stabilization. The first is the idea of using multiple camera paths instead of a single camera path. The idea here is to take each frame and cut it up into a 2D grid, and then you treat 2D grid mesh, and then you treat each mesh as a little video. And so then you compute a camera path for each mesh in that 2D grid. And so that's what happens here. So now we have multiple camera paths that we can play with. The second idea is called adaptive filtering. And in the uh, standard approach, um, isotropic filtering is used to smooth out the camera path. Um, what this uh, uh, means, however, is that it's not very good at handling large parts of, um, uh, it's not very good at handling rapid motion in the camera. So if, you're, if you have your phone and you're taking a, a video of, of some exciting movement, then you might, it, it, it'll be very jerky. And what happens then is from frame to frame, um, in order to accommodate for that, you'll have a lot of um, empty spaces. And then if you want to make it look pretty, you basically crop out the empty spaces. But the end result in your video is pretty uh, ugly. So what we can do is use anisotropic filtering, and that smooths out the, um, the, the disruptive motion um, that you get when you're doing rapid camera motion. So you can see that this is slightly be this is better. So what do these two um, new ideas put together give us in terms of video stabilization? Well, first we can handle parallax better. And that's because if you take a frame 
um, uh, in a uh, scene where there are different depths, you can a a accommodate for those different depths because we're actually using adaptive filtering of multiple camera paths. We also get less geometry distortion. So here you'll see on the lower left picture, the, the not so good uh, video, you'll see global shearing and global skewing and lots of local distortion if you look at where the red arrows are pointing. And the lower right is what, uh, what we get with our technique. We also get less cropping. So here you'll see, again, the lower left is the, uh, the old way and the lower right is what you get with our technique less empty areas, and thus less cropping, and, and thus a better looking video. In many um, cameras that you see on cell phones, they use CMOS technology, which means that they generate images by drawing line after line after line. And that means, again, with rapid camera motion, you get some really jerky videos. With our technique, we can smooth out the, the jerkiness and get a much more stable looking video. So I'm just going to show some more results. These are input videos um, and these are what they look smoothed. We can also handle people. And here is what it looks smoothed out. Good. So my society story actually um, is, comes from Microsoft Research India in, from the group called Technology of, uh, for Emerging Markets. It's a group in the research lab that really looks at how to use technology to help society. Before I show the video of this, I want to just explain a little bit about the technology that's used. It's um, the, the intent of this project was to actually help TB patients throughout India comply with the treatment that they, uh, the doctors want them to take in order to get rid of TB um, because uh, if, if you don't comply with the treatment, then you don't get rid of TB and then you still are someone who could spread TB. And so the technology is basically a biometrics terminal. And the idea is that uh, someone who's a patient goes to a clinic where there's such a terminal set up, and you use your finger on this biometric reader to show that you are who you are, and that then you are given the uh, medication, and you, you are taking the medication in front of a healthcare so that the healthcare worker can show that you are complying with that particular treatment. And of course, um, there's a, a database stored somewhere that keeps track of the fact that you've taken this treatment over the course of months. And so if at any time you miss a treatment, then someone can be alerted to make sure that you come back and, and, and so on. So I'm just going to pl uh, play the uh, video. Oops. We're gonna buy me what I want, my chota. My best me chota. It's taka chota. Where do I do it, chota? We need to have to have to say he hoga ki nahi hoga hi hiti maal me. In countries with great migration or transit of populations, you will find a greater proportion of tuberculosis happening so also in border regions of the United States. Wherever people travel and wherever they cough, they're going to give it to other people. Of the 9 to 10 million people that contract tuberculosis annually every year around the globe, it's about 2 million happen in India. Of these, a quarter million or so die. 50 million people in the world are infected by the bacteria causing multi-drug resistant TB. Unbelievable but true. For somebody who is poor, drug resistant tuberculosis definitely becomes a death sentence. And this represents the threat of really a pandemic because 
drug-resistant TB is also contagious. And so if this strain of TB actually spreads, it represents a threat to everyone. Operation Asha is running a fantastic program where health workers deliver medication to patients. But the tragedy and the threat in India is that that delivery breaks down. So the goal of this project is to make sure that doses of medication are delivered on the right schedule to tuberculosis patients throughout their entire six-month course of treatment. This could be a real disaster in public health. So it's everyone's business to understand and combat tuberculosis. Okay, one last story, and this actually picks up on the Curtis's talk, so I can uh, breeze through this quickly. But it's going to make a, the, the real point uh, about how impact that we do in computer science uh, can be on basic science, including astronomy, uh, technology, and society. So we start with what people have already been talking about today, both. Han about data, big data, and Curtis in terms of big data transforming astronomy. We start with, of course, astronomical astronomy data. From that, we have the worldwide telescope that allows us to have these kinds of worldwide or universal tours um, through uh, using the image data that we collect from ground telescopes to telescopes in the sky. So you can see here, we're taking a tour through the universe. We're going to hit the Milky Way. Um, and from the Milky Way, um, well, let's get to the Milky Way. <laughs> I'll, uh, cut this, I'll cut this short, because you've already seen a lot of Curtis's videos. One, but the point of this tour is that you can be quite deliberate in where you want to go in your tour, starting um, from outside um, the Milky Way to the Milky Way, into our own solar system, um, into visiting um, one of our planets, the Saturn, um, continuing on uh, till we eventually get to planet Earth. Okay, so as you saw from Curtis's talk, the ideas, the technology behind giving you a tour through the worldwide telescope is the exact same technology that can give you a tour through any big set of data, including data about the Earth. And so that's what an, um, is now in Excel as a feature, it's called Power Map. And so now basically if you have any spreadsheet of data, you can actually visualize this data and take a tour through it. So let's just look at one example. This is female literacy in the states of India. And I'm just going to depict what it's like to, to go through the, the states of India and see what the literacy is. And you'll see that in each of the five largest states, the female literacy is um, above average uh, compared to um, literacy of men and women put together, except for one of the states. Now, why am I showing you this? The reason I'm showing you this is that people talk about big data. But it's not just having big data. It's extracting knowledge from that data, for instance, as depicted uh, through these visualizations, 
But then it's about making intelligent decisions from that knowledge. So it's not really enough to just show you this data about female literacy in the five populous states of India. You could imagine a policymaker or a decision maker saying, well, why is the female literacy in this particular state less than the average? Or what about the other states? Um, or basically making some kind of government policy about education for uh, men and women in India. So another example of that is uh, traffic accidents in Seattle. And here's just a fly through. The reason I'm showing you this is um, maybe the amount of data used to calculate the female literacy in the, five, in the states of India is, isn't very large and that's not very impressive. But the amount of data in terms of traffic accidents in Seattle is much greater. And so you can actually use visualiza visualization to better see the differences of which intersections, for instance, could better use a stop light or a stop sign. And so we'll, there's, again, the point is from data to knowledge, to decision. And you can imagine the police force of Seattle or the traffic um, or, uh, department of Seattle looking at this data and saying, you know those two spikes we saw, well maybe we should actually um, uh, uh, put a stop sign or a stop light in those uh, highly traffic accident or prone, accident prone intersections. So, Obviously, one of the reasons I wanted to, t to tell you this story is that from astronomy to Excel to policy making, it really speaks to how research might start out as blue sky research, as Peter talked about, blue sky research in astronomy and, and science, leading to a new feature in our own technology at Microsoft in Excel. But in the end, it's not so much just about advancing science or just about a new feature in, in, a, in our technology. It's really about helping society. It's about, for instance, decision making, policy making, based on, for, in this particular case, the visualization of big data. Okay, in the remaining time I have, as I promised, I really wanted to talk about the future. I wanted to talk about the future because you are our future. Um, you are going to be the, the future researchers in computer science who are going to be choosing problems, solving problems, um, advancing science, creating new technology, and helping the world. And so I, very briefly, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, talk about some, the deep science questions that continue to drive our field, um, not dwell on these too much, but talk about uh, technology trends that uh, help drive the kinds of research questions computer scientists ask. And then some of the societal grand challenges that many computer scientists today are addressing. So I already talked about what is computable. This is probably the most fundamental question in computer science. This is our question, our science question. Unlike in astronomy where the question is something like, you know, what is the origin of the universe? Or in biology, what is the origin of life? What is computable is fundamental to computer science. It's, it harks back to Peter's um, example of uh, the factorial function, um, that, that mathematical function. Um, uh, 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 the second question I wanted to raise was the outstanding P equals NP question. This is probably the mathematical question that underlies our field and we don't know the answer to this. So this is something that uh, uh, theoretical computer scientists try to address. The question of what is information is shared actually by many dif 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 different disciplines. Biology now, for instance, considers itself an information science. Um, if you think about quantum information science, that really means there's that branch of physics that thinks of it uh, in terms of uh, information, where information may not be represented just in terms of bits, but qubits. 
The question of what is intelligent, uh, intelligence is an outstanding question for the field of computer science. It started the whole field of artificial intelligence um, back in the 60s, which branched then into separate questions uh, in terms of vision and speech and natural language processing and manipulation. And what's so exciting today is that all these separate branches that spawned out of the original question of AI are now coming back together. Uh, they're coming back together because some of the advances of techniques that we've, uh, we've had uh, recently, especially in machine learning, that are now being commonly used across vision and speech and natural language. And so now there's a hope that we can revisit this question of what is intelligence and really understand um, what makes humans uh, think. And then the, f uh, the last question, how can we tackle system complexity, really speaks to the engineering aspects of our field. We build tremendously large, complex systems. The internet is the most complex engineered system in the world ever invented by man. And it's amazing that it works. Um, but in fact, no one really understands how and why it works. One can't pro prove very many properties about the internet. Yet, we can't, uh, our lives depend on it. We can't live without it. Um, I wrote a little article that expounds on these questions. You're welcome to read. What about technology trends? Well, let's just look at machines and devices and the trends and technologies there. Uh, from the very large, so we've got exascale computing coming to the very small, uh, or the medium, wearables and portables, to the very small, nanocomputing, and using carbon nanotunes, for instance, to build our next um, generation of computers. Um, and the combination of molecular computing and nanocomputing, and of course, uh, information science, uh, is very much a teaser. One imagine uh, building computers out of molecules where a uh, communication between these computers, communication between molecules is through chemical reaction, not sending electrons over a wire. I um, mean, of course, the other teaser is quantum computing. In terms of scale and intelligence, we've already heard about big data, um, we know that the combination of cell plus cloud will give us the scale at the cell level in terms of billions of end users to the cloud of a storage capacity that will hold you know, information from everyone and everything uh, to the uh, billions of devices that are going to be sensors uh, uh, of the physical world also, data streams into the cloud for that. And then the, the, what you get from storing all this data in the cloud is the ability to share data across different applications and uh, um, to discover new knowledge based on data perhaps accumulated for one reason um, but analyzed for a different reason. Um, the, there's an area called cyber physical systems, which is where you have a, a, a physical, where you have a, a, um, a device that has a computational core that interacts, who, which interacts with the physical environment. So an embedded medical device is one example. Robots will be here. Uh, they will be in your home. They will be in your office. They will be. Um, a, at work, at play, they'll come in different sizes, they'll move, um, they'll manipulate, they'll do all sorts of wonderful things to improve our lives. Uh, neuroscience is a, a very hot area now in computer science, partly to understand what is intelligence, partly to understand the brain and if we can use the metaphor of the brain to understand techniques like deep learning, which Peter talked about this morning. Uh, the computer of today is not just the devices that we use, our, our, our phone or our laptops and so on. The computer of today is a network of humans and machines working together. 
The idea of crowdsourcing is just a simple a version of a network of humans and computers working together. Crowdsourcing, of course, gives us the scale to solve problems with multiple people. Um, but more importantly, it taps into the human intelligence of the individuals in this network of humans and computers. So the idea here is to combine the intelligence of machines, what machines are good at, with the intelligence of humans, what humans are good at. And the combination of human and machine intelligence gives us more than either alone. And finally, society. Um, the societal trends are in high expectations of our technology, in diversity of users, in personalization, and in addressing societal grand challenges. Energy, food, water, health care, education, transportation, and security and safety. So I'll stop here and just remind you of this triad of the drivers and impact of research in computer science. Uh, science, technology, and society. Thank you.